The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel. I'm the host for this podcast. Steve Siegel is our producer. And if you have a story to tell, reach out, because Steve will definitely get back to you. The best way to reach us is our email, theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com. Just a reminder before we start today to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, find our YouTube channel and subscribe there as well. When you subscribe and when you give us a thumbs up or a five-star rating, it helps more people find us and hear the message that we put out of help and hope. Today's episode is kind of interesting. I'm going to interview Rob Lohman, and he actually interviewed me for his podcast recently. Sober since 2001, Rob Lohman currently helps people suffering from substance abuse to find freedom from addiction and incarceration. He does this through sharing his testimony, per professional interventions and recovery coaching, advocacy, He's a self-published author and being the host of Beyond the Bars radio podcast. That's the one he interviewed me on. Rob has been through the ringer and keeps routing, bouncing back. His rap sheet includes alcohol and drug addiction, gambling addiction, divorce, bankruptcies, mental health and suicide ideation, prison recovery, and transformation. Rob now invests in the lives of those wanting to see positive change, whether it is coming out of addiction, prison, or just wanting more for their lives. He's a dynamic speaker and shares an extremely powerful journey of persistence, faith, and inspiration. Without any further ado, let's talk to Rob Lohman. So Rob Lohman, master podcaster, broadcaster, thank you for being on the podcast. It's great to be here today. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to kind of reverse the flow here. You interviewed me for your podcast. Now I'm interviewing you for our podcast. <laughs> That's the beauty of doing this, right? You can kind of flip flop when, when, it, when it warrants itself. Sometimes it doesn't always warrant that, right? So, right. Uh, yeah. Right. So the way I like to start is I know I read that you started drinking alcohol at age 14. So take me back there and tell me how you progressed from there. Yeah, it was crazy. You know, alcohol was always kind of around uh, family situations, more of a social thing a lot of times. Didn't have a whole lot of running around, you know, you know, crazy alcoholics in our family, but it was just always there. And I don't even know what led me to that point in time at age 14, but I'd seen it. I felt like I was really different than just a lot of the kids. Didn't feel like I fit in a lot. And, and I remember this one guy, I wish I could remember his name. I'd love to check in with him and see what he's doing these days. But I was actually at a little Christian uh, party with this group called Young Life. And it has no reflection on Young Life, so I probably shouldn't even say that. But I was at this party and one of the guys came and said, hey, Loman, you want to go have a couple beers? I got a six pack of beer and us and these two girls could go back and drink it. And I'm like, heck yeah, let's go. Not even a thought, not even a pause. And we literally walked through the bushes and I pretty much just cracked one and just slammed three beers like that. And they all nursed their beer. And at that moment, I'd, I'd pretty much say that alcohol grabbed me. Wow. You know, you were saying no reflection on that group. The very first young man we interviewed on this podcast was introduced to marijuana on a Boy Scout trip. And similarly, no way of dissing the Boy Scouts. They're a great organization. There he was, and an older scout introduced him to marijuana. So no no worries about any any negativity toward that group. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You can't, you can't blame the group, right? It's just the people. Yeah. I, mean, I was also the kid that brought, like, the flask on the church ski trip sometimes and snuck alcohol and those things. So even though we were part of a group that has – great messages, great intentions, great planning. It's, you know, you can't, you can't control the people that are there. So you never know what, what's going to happen. No. And that's a very good point. And we've said this like probably over a hundred times on the podcast is that um, addiction of any form knows no religious boundaries, no economic boundaries, no racial boundaries, 
I mean, it can happen to anybody. Uh, I used to, um, I, I know of a rehab that was getting um, young people from the Amish church who had become addicted because I guess there's a time when they reach a certain age where they're allowed to go out in the world and experience it, mm. you know? can happen yeah, to anyone. You can't, you can't protect everybody. I, mean, I have a 12 and a 10 year old now. And I remember uh, my daughter said to me you know, last year, she said something like, um, you know, dad, I don't, I don't ever want to drink alcohol because she knows what I do as an interventionist person, recovery, a recovery coach, all these things. And, and I said, I said, honey, I was like, I appreciate you saying that. I go, but my hope is that you would, would learn and be able to have a, a good relationship with alcohol and be able to have a glass of wine with your girlfriends or your husband someday. That I hope that is your story and it, not everyone's story is my story, which obviously is a crazy journey from 14 to now 48. So, <laughs> Well, tell us about that journey from 14 to 48, Rob. Oh, man. I, you know, from 14, uh, 14 to 29 is when alcohol was just a big focus of my life. And, and it just seemed like most of the stuff I did revolved around alcohol. You know, I, I grew up in a Christian home. You know, I love my parents. They're amazing. You know, they, they didn't have issues with substances. Um, when I was a kid or anything like that, it, it was just the environment that was around a lot. And I had an older brother and, you know, he liked his alcohol also. And so in that realm of hanging out with the older kids and those things, wanting to try to fit in, alcohol just kind of took those inhibitions away. And, um, you know, I felt like I was, you know, six feet tall and 200 pounds a lot of times, <laughs> But that's just what that's just what life was. I mean, I, I'd go drink during the day in high school and go back to classes and then drink before swim practice in high school. And and it was just around. And eventually I, I started making smart decisions like, well, I probably should quit swimming because I'm getting drunk before swimming. Instead and did, of, and did it affect your swimming, your ability to perform there? I, I, I don't even remember. All, all I oh. do know is that... I mean, I was fast. I was good. I mean, you know, um, I qualified. I was like on an alternate for state for our, you know, IM uh, relay team. And so I mean, so I was good, but it, but it definitely I'd say affected it because I could have been a lot better. And it's interesting when I just said that comment out loud that I decided to quit swimming because of alcohol. I should have probably quit alcohol because I wanted to swim, you know, but they say Should've, if you put alcohol. Yeah, yeah. You put alcohol in the same room with potential and alcohol wins. Yeah. almost every time. And, and then I went to college. I always wanted to be a doctor like my grandpa. He never drank a drop of alcohol in his whole life. He delivered probably half of Fort Wayne, Indiana as a general practitioner and just an amazing guy. And uh, so I always wanted to be like Bapa. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I went to college and already had a drinking issue. Uh, said I would never do drugs. Nope, not going there. But you got to try it. So freshman year, I tried smoking pot and I loved it. Mm. Uh, almost got kicked out of college twice my freshman year and, but just not having a lot of consequences. So I wasn't, I was like that college kid, right? Like, well, I got out of this and I got out of that and I wasn't being honest with my parents and just kind of hiding this little thing. They knew I probably drank too much, mm -hmm. but I also had a bad gambling addiction at this time also. And that was a hard thing because I didn't know how to control that. So I was just, I'd say an out of control college kid who wanted to go to medical school, but forgot that you need to study to do that. Right. Did it, I, I'm assuming that doing the alcohol and marijuana and the gambling affected your grades. You know, it's funny. I, I actually, if I needed to get an A, I would focus and I would get an A very easily. Interesting. But I just didn't, I just didn't have the drive or the, the I get, we'll just call it the discipline really. Um, right. Because I, I knew what I needed to get to skate by, to pass a class, or to get get the B, and those kind of things. And when it when it and I got I got end up getting arrested a couple times in college. I had a few arrests in high school too. You know, minors in possession. Oh, I was going to say possession. Is that yeah. is that what you got arrested? Yeah, for? Okay. they call it MIPs. And then in college, I got in trouble and and had to go to you know spent the night in jail. I had a couple overnights, but I had to go to. Um, a 12 step recovery program was, was forced to do that. And it didn't stick because I'm 19, 20, 21. These guys are 60. You know, they're talking about, um, I need they to got a problem. You don't have a problem. Yeah. Well, they're talking about I lost my boat, my wife. It was like a, you know, it was like a bad country song. And 
<laughs> like I don't, I'm not married. I don't have, I don't, I don't have a job. Well, actually I did have a job in college. I worked through college and, but, the, but it just didn't connect with me at this time because again, I hadn't had a whole lot of consequences because I usually got out of my situations and kind of sort of convinced myself of two things. One, I was invincible and two, that God had, God was keeping me alive for a much greater purpose and and I believe that I was just when you put alcohol on me, I was just your wild, crazy, run around party guy. But coming up to graduation in college, I had a, a biology degree and almost had a minor in psychology. But the day of graduation, it was so it was really hard for me because I again I wasn't being honest with my family. Um, I had totaled my car before my senior year, put on a bunch of weight my senior year, and it, I mean it was a bad accident. My, my car flipped end over end about six times Wow. up in Northern Michigan. I didn't have any damage to really damage to myself except my shoulder. So senior year, I put on a bunch of weight cause I drank a lot more and just was not physically active because my shoulder was hurting. So when I grew when my mom came to see me at graduation, she looked at me with just sadness in her eyes. Just like, she just said, honey, you're fat. <laughs> and I, I went to college about 150 pounds. And I left about 215. Wow. And a lot of that at the end, I mean, I had a bunch of muscle, but a lot was fat. And, but the day of graduation, both sets of grandparents were there. My aunts and uncles from Fort Wayne, Indiana were there. I went to college in Indiana and just relatives that lived locally came. And I did not know if I was going to graduate, but my parents did not know that I almost was not about to graduate. And, and I, and I, and I studied so hard for that final that I had to get a good grade in to pass this class, which was in my major. And I remember that morning of graduation, still didn't know if I was going to graduate. And my wow. biology teacher calls me in and he says, Loman, get to my office now. And you know, my heart sinks. Cause I'm thinking this is the worst news I'm, I'm going to hear ever. And right. fortunately, but unfortunately, um, he ended up showing me my test. It was like a five page test. And he goes, Loman, look at these scores. 99, 98. And he's flipping through and he goes, these are the highest scores I've ever had on a final exam of my classes. What have you been doing? Wow. Yeah. And I just looked at him. I said, did I graduate? And he said, yes. And I took off, took out of the room and I was so relieved. But, but again, if, if there would have been more consequences, who knows? But again, we don't look back and say if this would have happened because I'm grateful for what I do now. I've been through a lot of pain. And so that was college, you know, graduated within four years, first person in my family to do that. But I'm an alcoholic. I loved mushrooms. I liked acid, I liked gambling, you know, did not have a head on my shoulders very well at all. Right. So, so when you're done, you're still addicted and you're, and you're moving forward. Were you then working? Did you have like some kind of a, a corporate job of some kind? Well, I graduated with a bachelor of arts in biology okay. and the goal was to go to med school. So no, I was going to say, where did a, you go from there? Yeah, I mean, I'm, did, not, I'm not thinking with that. <laughs> I went to Vail, Colorado is where I went like any good recent college graduate and but I, I told my parents like I didn't know what I want to do so they actually let me go to Vail for a year and a half I worked I had a good you know I, I was good about to say I had a good job I was a bouncer at a bar and no <laughs> career focused job I was just a, a, a ski bum you know you know mountain biking bum just a guy living in Vail Colorado but I promised them a year and a half and that whole year and a half was just again so now we're in the year, uh, 1995, 96. Okay. I didn't stop drinking until 2001. So I still have another five, six years of just destruction in my life. Did you so, do any heavier drugs or just marijuana and alcohol? I don't mean just, but you know yeah. what I mean? Well, I, I was afraid of cocaine or anything else because I just, I knew that whatever I tried, I liked because it made me feel different, you know, and, and I knew I wasn't going to try that. I would never ride motorcycles because I was afraid I would die. So I had some boundaries, I guess you could say. Uh, but in 96, I moved back to Texas, got a job in corporate America with, you know, with a bank and just kind of had big boy jobs, you know, banking and got into commercial real estate, still partying like crazy and not having many consequences and just continue to go. I ended up getting married in 1999 to uh, another good alcoholic. Mm -hmm. We drank very differently, but still I went out, I mean, eight nights a week and drank a lot. 
and I just had very shallow relationships in my life just because of alcohol and just, you know, not having confidence in who I was. I lived on fear you know, my faith. I mean, still, I'm, I'm, I've been a Christian like my whole life. Right. But right. there is no evidence that I am a good person in a, a lot of my actions that I have in my life. Now I had tons of friends. They all came to me for struggles and issues and to talk through things. So I was, a, I was a really nice user, you know, okay. um, but I was gambling a lot too. And, and that led to a lot of manipulative behaviors. It's not just about placing the bets. It's moving all these pawns around in your life to get kind of what you want. Hmm. And so I was very, yeah, I was very disconnected from, yeah. Cause a lot of people think like you have a gambling addiction. That's it. You, you gamble, but no, it's about how it's a process addiction. Like how do I move these things around so I can free up time so I can do this, so I can drive to, Shreveport, Louisiana, at one in the morning and come back by Sunday to go to work. Just mental torture all around. And well, and, and to, sorry to cut in, but you yeah. make me think of the recent film, Uncut Gems. I mean, did you see that one? No, you know, I have not. I keep seeing on Netflix. I'm like, I got to watch that movie, oh, but I have not seen it. you got to watch it because there's a guy with, who's addicted to gambling. And it's that same thing, like everything is manipulative. If I can take this money from here and I can, I can gamble it over here and then I can maybe five exit and then I can pay this guy back. Oh, oops, I lost it. Now, you know, it, it's, it's one of those, anyway, it, it, you make me think of that when you talk about how manipulative being addicted to gambling is. It's interesting. I never, never heard that perspective before, but I've seen it in that film at least. It's quite, yeah. Yeah. It, and it's tough. And, and I didn't break free from gambling till way later in my recovery of, of substances, which we'll just speed up and get to that part of the story. Cause everything else is just, you know, it's, it's, it, well, it's important. It's a drunk. I mean, it's not even a drunk log. It's just, I was so not aware of, of things that were going on. And, and, and here I am married in Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? I'm working for my uncle who hired me. I had a six state region where I, where I worked. And so I was driving around a lot. And just kind of manipulating my schedule because places where I would actually, you know, we had shopping centers where I work actually were close to casinos. Uh. Right. And so I would go away, not drinking a whole lot on the trips, but it would be kind of gambling. I would get work done. And I was, you know, kind of good at what I did, but I, again, I wasn't focused and the potential that has been inside of me potential has been inside every person that's listening to your show that struggles with addiction there's yeah. so much potential in people. Yep. And I get emotional, I think, about that sometimes because it's just wasted potential. It just blah. And when I have a 10 and 12-year-old now, I'm like, man, I just want them to, like, have a different journey. Yep. You know, yep. They can learn from my stories, my pain, people I interview, all those things, right? And um, this weekend, I'm actually taking my son away for a weekend called this Family Life Ministries has a a passport to purity. And we're going to go talk about the importance of relationships with women and how do you date a girl and all these things, but it's a solid curriculum that I get to walk my son through this weekend being very oh, intentional cool. with him. Yeah. I I'm, like that. I'm excited about it. It's going to be really spot on and, and he's excited about it, which is even better. Um, but well, about six about months. Wasted, sorry. You talk about wasted yeah. potential and, and you know, we, the biggest waste of potential is when a young person or anybody overdoses, mm -hmm. you know, and then we lose that person. We lose the creativity. I mean, you know, we know of a young gentleman who, you know, was on the road to recovery and had been sober for several months and overdosed. And, and the loss of that potential just absolutely broke my heart into many little pieces. And truthfully, that's why we do this podcast, Rob, is we, we want parents who are listening, if they know somebody who's addicted to do something about it right now, you know, don't wait, don't, don't wait until after the next holiday. Don't wait until it's convenient. It's never going to be convenient and they need to get help now. But I digress. I was going to ask you, what would you say was your point of no return? When did yeah. you reach that point where you went, okay, I either get clean or I'm, I'm going to just be a bum under the bridge or I'm going to die. Yeah, that was uh, June 8th, 2001. And about six months before all of this was going down and I was just really confused. I'd, I, I'd, I was divorced from my first wife just because it just wasn't a healthy marriage and tried and it just, I just, 
felt like it was just time that we just parted ways. And again, it wasn't how I base my marriage now, you know, on my faith and that you got to work through the hard times and all that. It was just, I was very shallow at that time. So about six months before June 8th, 2001, I was really struggling with, I'd, I'd just say a lot of me- unhealthy mental, not mental illness, but just not being mentally well, we'll say that. Because I would start having a lot of suicide ideation. It started kind of taking over because I, ha- I hated who I was becoming. Yep. I, lo- I loathed who I saw in the mirror and I was just a manipulator and just wasn't, wasn't the guy that God intended me to be at all. And I would, all of a sudden I would start seeing, you know, I'd be driving down the highway the next day after a good night of partying or whatever, you know, every night was a party. Hmm. And I would eventually see my car veer off the highway and crash into a median, blow up, explode, different scenarios. But I would see myself die often hmm. in those moments. And I didn't know what that was, but I sure wasn't telling anyone about it because then you'd think I was crazy. You know, people already knew I was wild, but. But this was happening more and more and they were pretty intense and I was getting scared. So I started wanting more for my life. I really did. I wanted to get back to church. I wanted to these things, but I just, I didn't really know how to really make that bridge that gap if you would. So one night, so the night of June 7th, 2001, I was hanging out in a bar in Fort Wayne, Indiana, music, you know, girls, alcohol. And then all of a sudden the bar got completely dead silent and I audibly heard the words you're done. And then the bar got really loud again. Wow. And that was all my own personal experience. No one else had that experience in the bar that night. And I looked at my buddy, Sean O'Brien, and I said, hey, Sean, I got to go. I don't know what just happened, but I think I'm actually done drinking for wow. good. Wow. And he laughed because we drank a lot together. And you might have uh, said it before, but. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't say a whole lot of like, you know, I'm, I'm done. Like I'm over, like, I don't want to ever do this again. That was, it was just what I did. It wasn't like, gosh, I don't, I mean, I didn't want to get alcohol poisoning again, like I did before, but it wasn't this thing of like, I'm just never going to drink again in my entire life. And excuse me, my throat was getting dry there, but the, um, but so in that moment, you know, as I was driving home, I kind of felt like I was sober, but drunk at the same time. Cause I didn't know what just happened at the bar that had never happened to me before but I was also highly inebriated and driving home that night. And I got to my little one bedroom apartment in Fort Wayne, Indiana, walked up about 12 stairs to my you know, open loft that had a workout gym in the, you know, in the living room, which as I joke about every bachelor does, right. Mm-hmm. You just want to this, this thing about just looking good and you feeling like complete junk inside. Mm-hmm. But I walked past my dog, Jake and put about 350 pounds on the barbell and put my hands on the barbell as I laid down and picked up that barbell and unhinged my elbows to just drop it right across my chest. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And and in that moment, what I believe happened was like time kind of stopped for a minute and, and God intervened and revealed himself to me through my dog, Jake because Jake was nudging my knee with his head and just looking at me with those puppy dog eyes and just kind of like, what are you doing, dad? Yeah. You know, wow. My first, my first thought was, holy cow, who's going to feed you tomorrow? Right. And then I started thinking about my parents and my brother, and this is like milliseconds of time because I still right. have this huge rack, like barbell above my head, which I can, can't even bench sober, much less highly intoxicated. And, and I truly believe that that was God saying all those years, when I told you that I was keeping you alive for a bigger purpose, well, it starts now. And he put that rack, that barbell back on the rack. And of course I can see this happening as I tell you the story. It was such a pivotal moment in my life, this point of no return, right? As you say, and wow. I felt God's peace in that moment. And I felt him embrace me. And we went in the kitchen together and poured out all my alcohol. And I slept in peace for the first time in many, many, many years. Wow. And yeah. And you give me chills, Rob. I mean, that's (laughs) such a, that is definitely a point of no return and definitely an epiphany. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's those things that you don't, you don't really know what's going on inside of you because you're so discombobulated with life and you don't like who you are and you're putting on this image, which is in conflict of what you deep down believed as a kid and all this stuff. And so there's 
all this inner turmoil. But when you start believing that you, that you suck and that you may as well just die and all these thoughts, well, I didn't plan to go home that night and try to kill myself. Right. Right. And that would have been something that would be like, what an idiot. He went, he tried to work out when he was hammered in the evening, but that wasn't my intent at the time. Right. And that next morning, I felt completely different. And I was up to like two bottles of scotch a day because I did a lot of entertaining clients and golf and marketing and this kind of stuff, right? It wasn't all the time, but I could drink a lot in a day. And my aunt picked me up that morning. Uh, I meant to call her because I wanted her. She lived in Fort Wayne, but I called my parents. My mom says I cried for an hour. She cried for an hour. I just said, I need help. First time I'd really reached out for help. And my aunt picked me up in Fort Wayne and took me to a, uh, an establishment and she parked her car on the curb in like a busy street in downtown Fort Wayne. We went through the front door of a bar, <laughs> walked straight to the back of the bar to an AA meeting. Well, it's 12 step recovery meeting in the back of the bar. And all these people were laughing and having a good time and they were sober. And I, I, I was just in hook, line and sinker. And I have not had, I didn't go through detox. I haven't had a craving in since that day, it's just of all the chaos in my own recovery of, you know, almost 19 years or 19 years, I've not had one desire or craving that th thought alcohol or substances would, would be a answer. So I was just immediately divinely removed from any obsession or compulsion to drink alcohol. Wow. That's quite a story because so often we hear that people who, you know, drink a lot of alcohol or, or alcoholics, if you will, that there's there's a physical liability to just stopping that you know there can be seizures and you know various different physical things that can happen so you definitely are a miracle story you are listening to the addiction podcast point of no return for more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us go to our facebook page by the same name or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com or call us at 727-314-7080. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I dot org or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. Best selling author of Addicted to Dimes, Confessions of a Liar and Cheat, Catherine Townsend Lyon believes that addiction doesn't discriminate on who it touches. Her addiction required no substances and is just as dangerous as any other. So if you know a loved one or friend who might be a problem gambler, you can purchase her book, Addicted to Dimes, Confession of a Liar and Cheat, on Amazon.com and Amazon Kindle. Her ebook is now on sale for $2.99 and available in paperback, also on sale for $6.95. Yeah, I'm in the small percentage, I would definitely say. And it is, and it, what you just said is very important for people to even hear that too, that if you do have a loved one that is seriously addicted and, and toward time our bodies physically are dependent on alcohol to where if we don't we can go into dts and and have seizures and die um, that's not one of those just simple hey stop drinking honey and just cold turkey it you can die from this stuff so medical detoxes are extremely important for people that are physically dependent on alcohol 
Um, Cause not everyone's physically dependent, but a lot of people are, and that's something you can seriously die from if you just quit cold Turkey and think you can just do it. So that that's true. That's why I think your story is, is so miraculous. So what led you from there to start helping other people? Because you've been doing a lot helping other people. Tell us about that. Yeah, I'm definitely you know busy in the intervention coaching um, podcasting world. But you know, my story. You, you sit there and look at that and think like, oh, that was that was a really crazy part of your story. Like, it can't get any worse than that because you're in recovery now. So I'll tell this little part is kind of a, a speeded up part of the story. But um, I was Mr. Recovery for a long time. And in 2006, I ended up meeting my amazing wife that I'm married to now uh, through a, a big Christian concert I was working on putting on. We met, she worked with a Christian radio station. I was talking about this big vision that God put on my heart to inspire people to believe in who they are and, and just really be safe and secure in their identity, right? Mm-hmm. And so this big, huge three-day Christian, mes- Christian music festival that God called me to do. And I'm back in, I'm back in Vail, Colorado, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, so I had some transitions in life, but now I'm back in Colorado as after I graduated college, you know, in 94, now 12 years later, I'm back in the state of Colorado living. My wife and I, you know, fell in love, felt like, you know, we were old enough to kind of really know who the other person was and it, it didn't take long. And we were, we met and married in under six months. Um, her father was passing away and dying of cancer. So we were, we, we got married a little faster than we probably originally planned. And, but, uh, unfortunately Archie passed away a month before we were married Mm. and we had a beautiful wedding, you know, just two people on fire, you know, for the Lord and really focused in that regards. And then life continues to to take off real fast as we get pregnant, pregnant right away and have my first son I'm telling you about now that we're going away this weekend to do this, this passport to purity weekend. And Over time, I started becoming more fear-driven than faith-driven because now I'm a husband. I wasn't that in early recovery. Now I'm a father, and I I just felt real inadequate in those areas. Um, Hmm. The way I internalized life and and just my external surroundings, I I just started telling myself kind of those messages again that you, you don't measure up. You're not good enough. You know, my, my daughter was born in 2010 mm-hmm. and just um, amazing, beautiful daughter. And she's, she's 10 now. <laughs> and, but I just stopped going to my recovery meetings and stopped mm-hmm. tapping into Bible studies. Cause I was like, I have to get an ordeal done to pay my bills. You know, now mm-hmm. I have a, I have not only a, a rent payment at home, but I have a, a, an office now and all these other expenses. And I, and I just wasn't doing well in my business and the wheels started falling off. You know, I missed some sales numbers, um, ended up, uh, in, in October 31st, 2011, I ended up losing my, my career just based on missing sales and production numbers. Wow. Now I'm still gambling a lot at this time, just to let you know. Mm. So my faith is now over here and I'm living in this fear driven mode of, well, let's go buy a roll of scratch tickets and scratch them or let's run off to the casino and not tell my wife and I can just charge on the credit card and she'll never know. And so I, I was deceiving her a lot, uh, deceiving myself a lot, believing I get like that quick, that quick win. And I was just a complete mess again, wow. just like I was before I got sober. Right? I was heavy in my addictions then and, I, and now I'm heavy in this gambling addiction and I'm and now you have this. a wife and two kids. Yeah, yeah, a wife and two kids. And so I'm like, I, I have to, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay this, so I'm going to go do this. And just moving, again, as we talked about, pieces around. I'll transfer money to this credit card and, and these things. And um, so there, you know, just there were just a lot of challenges going on, especially like in our my relationship with my wife because I wasn't being honest. And we had, you know, just had some struggles between us and, I guess learning how to, you know, deal with conflict. I wasn't great at conflict. I ran from conflict and my wife's an amazing person and, and she's a justice seeker. Right. And, mm-hmm. and wants conclusions. And I'm like, I don't want conclusions. I don't know what to do. Like, you know, just this turmoil. So, but what started happening, if you remember before I got sober, you see a pattern here, I would see myself die and these, these, these suicide ideations. Well, that's back now. 
suicide ideations are back, but I'm now self harming myself and in a, in a much worse mental space than I was then. I feel probably the same space. Wow. But in, in, and people may not know anyone that's dealt with this before and I didn't either. So I wasn't telling anyone about it, but I'm telling you right now, if you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you guys reach out to me because yep. this is a, this is a sucky place to be. But I, I started hating who I was again. And I, one night, I don't know where this came from. I literally took my fist one night as I was sitting in my insurance office, looking around, not knowing what to do, paralyzed by stacks of paper. And I took my fist and I cracked myself in the side of the head as hard as I could. Wow. And something happened that night. It was like, oh, now I can function. And then I could get work done. And, and that became a pattern. And to the point where some nights I would, and again, I would, I would isolate from my wife and go to my office because I didn't want to deal with what we were dealing with, mm -hmm. right? And just isolate myself. But I would, it would be so tender sometimes, like I couldn't even put my glasses on because the side of my head hurt so bad. You were literally knocking sense into your head. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like, who the heck does that? And and interesting enough, later when I got some psychological help for this, uh, a therapist actually said to me, and after what I'll tell you here in a minute happened, she looked at me and said to me, why would you do that to yourself? Mm. I'm like, holy crap, you just shamed me for something I just told you, which I had never told anyone before. I'm mm -hmm. not telling anyone that again. <laughs> like, I wish I knew this person's name to see if they're still in business because – that was horrible what, I mean, the, but it was my way of internalizing it. But as a professional of trying to help someone, please, yeah. if you're a therapist, don't ever say to your client, why would you do that to yourself? Yeah, that's, yeah. That's why yeah. I told you, because I'm here to deal with this, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so, wrong. yeah. So, um, so I ended up losing my career at the end of October, 2011. Um, my wife ended up quitting her job a month later because she was, we were both so just stressed and running on adrenaline and our adrenals were shot. We had two young kids. We were passing batons because we were both working full time. Like our, there was no real depth in our life at that time because it was so survival mode. Yeah. Right. But now here I am, a complete loser again. Again, my own internalization. It doesn't matter what's being going on around me. This is the way I internalized it, right? Right. And because if I was strong in who I was, which I believe I am now, these outside factors wouldn't affect me. Right. Like I, like I allowed them to, right? So, but here I am, you know, 2012, out on my, you know, just out of work <laughs> and all these things happening and just self-loathing. And in February of 2012, I ended up having a major mental breakdown mm -hmm. and lost it one night and just in a complete mental blackout and again, my family had gone to bed. I'm a late owl, always have been, right? And I was just sitting on my desk with my laptop computer on our couch, looking for a site, looking for a job and working on a side job. And then I was like, you know, forget this. I'm just going to get up and clean the house because it was very disorganized. I still have a problem with clutter, <laughs> but it doesn't, I didn't know I had a problem with clutter then. So, you know, I've got huge gambling addiction, self-loathing, hating who I am tons of clutter, like I'm just a complete wreck. And I end up having a, uh, just a moment of lack of clarity and I call it a mental blackout and ended up grabbing a box of matches and lit some boxes on fire in my covered patio. Wow. And once I realized what I had done, I couldn't stop it at all. And, you know, we had, we had all of our stuff outside on the covered patio just due to an incident that had happened the year before and which is all just plays into this subconscious driving of life right and and it's amazing how i've learned since then like how much that just drives us to this crazy points in our life that are really unexplainable a lot of times yep but but regardless i did it and in that moment i you know ran upstairs ripped my wife out of bed she had to go get my daughter out of her crib and my son i got him out of his bed and we ran downstairs in that moment it's still the fire still outside so i ran out and you know, knocked on my neighbor's doors, woke them up. We got out, but right when we went out the front door, the backdraft caught and pretty much like blew our patio up. Oh my goodness. And we lost pretty much everything that night. Wow. Um, along with the, you know, no one physically got hurt, but the emotional damage I caused our community and my wife 
and everything we've had to endure because of my actions um, has been crazy, but like crazy good and crazy bad in some ways, because there's been so many miracles that have happened in our life since then. Mm -hmm. And so many, you know, these not great moments, God showed up and made them great moments. And so what happened after that, just, you know, I ended up a few months later confessing or a few weeks later confessing to what had happened. And, um, it was to my wife, not to anyone else. Um, just cause I've been lying to her and that was really hard. I think that was the biggest pain point that I completely lied to her about any of this instead of just letting her know where I was and what happened. And, you know, and it could have been a completely different story, but it's a story we have now, which is a good story because of what I get to do in right. helping people. And that ended up just the next year and a half was pretty crazy, but ended up being um, a point where I turned this entire situation over to God and said, Hey, this is your show. And so June, wow, we're in June right now. That's crazy to think about this. Mm -hmm. So in June, 2012, I ended up um, confessing what had happened and radio silence from the authorities until six months later. And at that time I ended up uh, getting arrested with 19 felonies and 13 misdemeanors. Okay. And it was quite a, it's been quite a journey, quite a journey since then. Really? So that was the end of 2012, about six months after yeah. you told your wife and then, yeah, I, I was going to ask what happened because yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I we, mean, we. I mean, it is a it's a crime. I am not trying to, yeah. Oh yeah, I'm not trying to minimize anything by uh, any way whatsoever. And I'm not trying to point point a finger at you. I'm just saying I just wondered what had happened. So did you do jail time? Yes, uh, it was um, anywhere from a range of what was on the table was like you know two to four, all the way up to fifty six. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Oh, Rob! Wow. Yeah, it was, it was quite, it was quite a journey in that regard. And, um, and that's a wake but, up call in itself. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but, it was, but in this, it's trusting God with the whole outcome of everything, you know, and being able to try to make sense of it all. And my wife to figure out what do I do? You know, what is this going to look like? And how do I be mom and dad and, provider and all this stuff, you know, depending on what happens to, to him, to me. Right. So on July 8th, 2013, um, I ended up, uh, getting, you know, sentenced, if you will, to 13 years. Okay. And on two charges and it was eight and five year charge. And I ended up going away for what was supposed to be five years. Okay. First and time I've ever, I didn't know anyone had been involved in this situation before, but it was, uh, you know, th that period of time. And, and it, sorry, I slowed down a little bit on the, on the journey of the story because, you know, as my kids kind of walk through the house, as we get to do <laughs> podcasting from our homes and stuff, there's, there's certain right. aspects that they don't know all right. of because, you know, in the essence of me wanting to share this with them, it's you got to be intelligent with the timing of their age of maturity to handle those things. It, exactly. So how much time did you actually yeah. end up doing? So 10 and a half months. Okay. And you and, were... You were let out on good behavior? Uh, well, the system's just a really interesting way it works, but uh, I say completely God's favor. I mean, I had this time to figure out who I was again, what do I believe in, you know, why does my faith mean what it does to me, all these things, while I'm kind of like in this, this, this seminary aspect, if you will, of my life where I have all this time. And then again, my wife's back home trying to do everything. So, so I, I felt real guilty being there because her life was harder than mine there, except I just wasn't with my family. So... I ended up only seeing them about six days in that 10 and a half months. But while I was there, there's two promises that God gave me. One is you'll get the halfway house the first round, which I did mm -hmm. on a charge they usually don't let in because of insurance reasons, and he'll heal my marriage. And those are the two promises I believe I received there. So in, in those regards, I feel like um, I 10 and a half months, 11 months in a halfway house, and then began the journey of how I'm doing what I do now as a result of all of that, just again, continuing to be in my faith and trusting the process that I'm doing right now. Well, you have, so little over six years really, that you have really been giving back to people and doing your podcast and 
helping with the um, interventions, you really have been giving back. You could let you hit the ground running. Is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, you have to, because I mean, with, with things on your record, it's hard to get a good quality job. So I ended up getting trained to do what I do now and launch my own business in interventions and coaching. And then over time ended up being invited to be a part of this huge podcasting network and, and be able to do that. I've always wanted to do one. People are always like, you have a great voice and all these things. I'm thinking, okay, but I don't know how to do this. And then I got, it was able to get trained to do that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a go getter. I'll learn how to do something and I'll say, okay, but what I've learned over time, Joni, through, I guess, wisdom, I guess you could say, is that mm-hmm. when I have an idea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think about it first before I act <laughs> instead of idea, go. You know, <laughs> I, I do that. It's like, whoa. You know, it's kind of like that was my life a lot. Um, gratefully, my wife, again, and I, we've worked through a lot of a lot of those scenarios of life that happened in rebuilding trust. And, you know, I've been able to really look at what what matters most to me. And, yep. um, you know, last year, my wife and I went through a, a pretty hardcore four and a half month kind of marriage ministry healing that we went through. Okay. And we learned a ton about each other, stuff I didn't know about me. She didn't know about her. We didn't know about each other, why our life kind of made sense and how we looked at each other. And, and just, it had this clarity, right? And around that same time, my wife said to me, she goes, honey, you, I, I want to go on a cruise. And for me, when I hear a cruise, this financial insecure guy that used to be like, like everything would be a trigger. Like, Oh, how are we going to pay for that? Right. Like, let's not dream. Let's, how are we going to pay for that? You know, and that was my gambling stuff that again was still going on until 18 months ago. Like I've been free from my gambling addiction for 18 months now, Wow. Um, but I didn't know I needed to work on it until I got into this field. And I'm like, Holy cow, I need to work on it. I can talk substance. I can talk about finding your identity, all these things, but, but dude, you're still gambling. Not a ton, not like it was before, but it's still there buying scratch tickets and stuff like that. So, um, but my wife says, Hey, the, you know, honey, the only cruise I would ever go on would be this family life marriage cruise. I'm like, that would be great. You know, just kind of receiving it at that time. And kid you not a very short period of time after that, one of my wife's friends calls her up and says, Hey, Jen, um, Chris and I were supposed to go on this family life marriage cruise. We can't go now because some things changed. We were thinking about selling it, but then we feel like God said, hey, just give it to somebody. So February of this year, my wife and I got to go on a free eight-day family life marriage cruise with 2,100 other couples and work on a lot of the struggles and issues. Um, but it was just a huge blessing. And so don't, just don't ever give up the fight. I mean, things are, there, there's so much more to the story of everything that happened. Like one of my collateral damages is I owe – $187,000 in restitution, mm. you know, and I've never missed a payment, been paying, even when I was incarcerated, been paying all along. Right. And in that though, there were some laws I didn't like that didn't seem fair. So I got involved with prison fellowship. We were talking about Craig Roche earlier, got involved with prison fellowship and, but just on my own initiatives, taking action. And we were able to get a, a bill passed in the law last year that dropped the interest rate in Colorado on restitution and people that are incarcerated now no longer are charged interest on their restitution while they're away. And well, there's a lot, you know, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, there's well a lot, done on a, getting that done, but I kind of go, wow, you had to get that done. Okay. Yeah. And there's a lot more work to be done in there. So my second point in no return is December 31st, 2018, when I was like, you know, after about 13 months in Celebrate Recovery, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm done with gambling. Like, it's just gone. It's got to be gone. And I can say, at least for me and my own beliefs, that even though I get agitated during the day sometimes and stuff, it's a complete different frustration of life because that was a lot of my mental energy was how to go return a Red Box movie at night so I could literally just drive to the gas station and buy some scratch tickets. You know, I don't, I don't have to think that way anymore. Um, right. But I didn't know I needed to work on it until I knew I needed to work on it. And then when I was ready to work on it, I finally worked on it. So there's always work to do in recovery. No, no matter whether you have an addiction or not, like life yep. is about recovering from something. Yeah, you know, I think that's a very, very good point. So Rob, if someone um, wanted to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to do that? How do they reach you? I, I love to give my number out. If you guys want to call me at 970-331-4469. Just call me directly, send me a text, tell me you're struggling. But if you want to go to my website, it's liftedfromtherut.com. 
And the other thing that's really cool is I'm putting on this, it's a free online virtual summit to teach families, individuals, how to go from addiction to living a transformed life. Wow. So we have probably close to 30 experts on the summit. It launches June. Well, it, it start, starts or started depending on when people are hearing this June 30th and goes for 21 days and okay. they can find all that info out at the art of intervention project.com. Totally free, amazing speakers, but I'm just doing what I can to bring people resources. And if they choose to call and use me as a interventionist or recovery co coach to help their family move forward, I'm all for it. And I, I love being able to help people instead of selling like software widgets or real estate. I now get to invest in people's lives. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm grateful that I'm still married. I'm grateful that I have <laughs> two amazing kids and, uh, and God just keeps showing up in our life. And I'm, I'm, I'm not ever going to let my faith falter or, or fade again. That's awesome. Rob, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to see you again. Thank you for joining us for today's podcast. I think that Rob's story was quite something, wasn't something I was aware of, even though we have spoken before. The point is that you need to believe in yourself enough and you need to believe in your loved one enough to get them help, to get them into treatment. And please don't wait. You need to get them into treatment now. You need to reach out now for help. If you don't know who to reach out to, you can reach out to our sponsor, Narconon Ojai. You can go to narcononohai.org and their chat there is completely anonymous. The point is there is help available and you just need to take that first step and you need to reach out. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and also subscribe to our podcast on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube. Give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and help other people find us. Thank you so much for listening. We will be back again next week with another interview. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narcanon Ojai. For more information on Narcanon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcanonojai.org. Narcanon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.